Hey there, this is Raimu. This is part six of my introduction to Rust series, taking it one step at a time. So in this video, we're going to cover methods, ownership, and borrowing. And I've already skipped ahead in the previous videos. I would just show how to make a new project, but I think you guys know how to do that now. In this video, we're going to do a lot with structures. So let's go ahead and define a couple structures here. We're going to make something called an item and something else called hands. So this is modeling a concept that you have two hands and your two hands can be holding items. So we're going to have your left hand has an item and your right hand has an item. Now what's in an item? We'll just keep this simple. We'll say what is it as a string and a boolean to say if something is present or not. All right, now let's set up our hands. Let our hands equal hands. Left is going to be an item. Right is also going to be an item. Now, what we're going to put in these hands, let's say an apple and a banana. So present is true in both cases. All right, now let's talk about our first problem here. As the Rust Analyzer is going to point out, we have a type mismatch. So you might think, that looks like a string. Why can't I assign those two, right? There are actually two types here that are different. This string in apple is a constant string. It exists for the entire lifetime of the program. Nothing owns it. Whereas the what inside of an item is a string that is owned by the item. So it might seem a little confusing at first that we have two different types. The difference is who owns the string. String spelled out with a capital S is an owned string, meaning that when the item is destroyed, so is the what string. A constant string here, which is represented by lowercase str and an ampersand in front, which we'll talk more about in a little bit, represents a string that is borrowed. Technically, it's called a string slice. It lets you access the characters in the string, but you can't change its length. So how do we resolve our problem here? The trick is to take the string and call a function on it called toOwned. We'll do that on both of these strings. Now it might look a little weird that we're calling a function that looks like it's somehow associated with that string, but just go with it for now. So let's do something with these hands. Let's say we're gonna print out the contents of the hand. So print left hand is holding something. So it would be hands.left.what. Let's handle the case where the left hand might not be holding something. So using control flow, we can say if hands.left.present then print the left hand is holding something. Otherwise, we're going to print that the left hand is not holding anything. Okay, and then let's copy this code and handle the right hand instead. All right, let's take a look at what it prints out. Left hand is holding an apple, right hand is holding a banana. Okay, let's make this a little bit more fun and introduce juggling. Let's add a temporary variable called the air and have it take on what the left hand is holding so that the left hand can take what the right hand is holding. And then finally, what we just threw in the air ends up back in the right hand. Now, Rust Analyzer is helping me out here a little bit. It's saying that I didn't declare hands as mutable. So indeed, we need to declare it as mutable as we learned earlier. And we're going to print out what the hands have after this little juggling act. Let's run that program. So, oh, let, actually, let me add another print thing so it's not as confusing. Let's say print line here. Let's juggle. Run that again. Okay, so... Oh, let me raise that up a little bit. Left hand's holding an apple, right hand's holding a banana. Let's juggle. Left hand is now holding the banana, right hand is holding the apple. So we do get a warning here, which is a little bit of cheating by Rust Analyzer. It's saying that it looks like we're swapping something. There's a better way to do this using some library function. So for now, so that this doesn't uh, get in the way and distract us, let's put an attribute on our main function to ignore that. So we're going to allow manual swapping. Okay, now as I was writing this code, you might have noticed that I have quite a bit of redundancy here. We're not only printing out the hands twice, each hand printed out is pretty similar to the other. So let's do a little bit of refactoring. We're gonna take this code and extract it out into a function. So let's copy that for now. Down here we'll make a function, report. 
and we're going to have our hands. All right, and then we're going to call that function up here. Report hands. Now we're running into a problem. Let's hover over and see. Use of moved value, hands.write. It was moved on line 24. Indeed, it was because unless we added the capability for a value to be copied, something like a structure by default is moved when it's passed into a function this way. So this presents us with a problem. How do we call this function with our hands in order to print it out without moving the hands into the function? Or alternatively, how do we get the hands back out? So one thing you might think of, which will work, is we can simply get the hands back from the report. And this should work, as long as I capitalize that. And we could do that again down here. Run that, make sure it still works. But there's a slightly better way, because it seems sort of clumsy that we'd have to move something into a function and move it back out. What if we could have the function not take the hands directly, but just borrow them for a little while? Rust lets us do that by using the ampersand in front of the type name. This is telling Rust that the function is not going to own the hands and then have to return it back when it's done. It's simply going to borrow it for the duration of the function call. So we no longer have to return the hands. So we would remove the assignment here. But in order to pass the hands back in, we have to put an ampersand in front here as well. In Rust, whenever you see the ampersand, think of borrow. So that's essentially what it is. So during the function call to report, report is borrowing the hands. When report is finished, that borrow goes away. So it lets us manipulate the hands and then call report again. Okay, let's make our function a little bit better by eliminating this redundancy as well. So let's make another function called report item that borrows an item. And we're going to copy this code out, paste it there, and we're going to call it here, report item. And again, we can borrow from hands to get the left hand out. Hands.left turns into item. And now how do we reuse this with the right hand? If we simply pasted that and put right, the problem we're going to run into is it's going to say left hand for both left and right. So how do we fix that? Now, if you thought the answer was another function argument, you're exactly right. Let's call it which. Now, you might be tempted to put a string here and then replace left with that, and then put which, and then here put left and right. But this is a mistake again, because constant strings are not owned. So we could do as we did before and say to owned. This should work. But why own something when we only need it for a short time? Why not borrow those strings? As we talked about before, the borrowed string is the string slice. Now it should make a little bit more sense why we had to put an ampersand in front. We're borrowing these strings. They happen to be called string slices because they're not the full own string type. We're not allowed to change the length of the string, but we are allowed to peek into the characters to use them for printing, other things like that. So at this point, we should get back to it working. Now looking at our main program, there are a couple things that we could refactor out. We can make juggle into a function. Let's try to do that. Right click, refactor, extract a function. We'll call that function juggle. Uh-oh, another problem. Hovering over that, we see cannot move out of hands.left, which is behind a mutable reference. Now, the lesson here is, how did we juggle in the first place? We use the assignment operator. In Rust, the assignment operator will try to copy the value if it can be copied, but if it can't, it is a move. So in this case, it's moving hands.left and moving it into the air. This begs the question, what does hands.left have after the move? The answer is nothing. It is a hole. Think about it as it no longer owns the left hand. Now this is fine if we own hands. It's not fine if we're borrowing hands, even borrowing mutably. I forgot to mention this before, but if you need to change something that you're borrowing, you want to put the MUT keyword in between the, the ampersand and the rest of the type 
Just like as you would a value that you plan to change as we declared up here for hands itself. Still, even though we borrowed it mutably, we're not allowed to create holes by moving things out that are owned. So in this case, the quickest solution is the same as what we tried a little bit ago, which is to have Juggle own it, but then return it back out. We'll do this for now. So we need to make hands, Juggle hands. And then finally, we want to mutate the hands while we own it. And we're back to the program running again. So let's improve this a little bit more. Let's separate our main program from these data types by pushing the data types down into a module. We'll call it model, as in it's modeling something that we're working with. And we're gonna make both item and hands public so that they can be seen by our main program. And then control dot on this hands to do import to automatically add an import for hands. And we'll wanna do the same thing for item. Import model item. Now when we scroll down, we see we have another problem. How do we access the inner fields of these structures? Now one solution is simply to make them all public. Let's do that real quick and I'll show you what that looks like. Our code runs just fine this way. But it did require us to open up the contents of our structures, which is not really that great in, when we're talking about object-oriented programming where the goal is encapsulation. So let's try to solve this in a way where we can encapsulate or hide the internal details of these structures. Now the solution, like in a lot of other programming languages, is to take these functions and make them methods of the types that they manipulate. So to do this, we take these functions out, put them into the module near the structures, and then we're going to enclose them into a new block. For the ones which manipulate the hands, we're going to put them into the implementation of hands. And for the one which manipulates items, it's impl items. Now the only thing remaining here is because we've put these functions inside the implementations, we have to mark that type that it goes with in front of the name of the function. So in this case, it's item. And at the bottom where we use hands, we put hands. Put that in front of report and juggle. And I forgot to make these functions all public. Let's do that. Now I need to do the same thing with this so-called constructor. So the idiomatic way of doing this in Rust or the common way of doing this in Rust is to make a function in the implementation of hands called new. So let's first take this function and refactor it out and do a function and call it new. And then let's move it into the implementation of hands. So we're gonna take that and paste it into the implementation of hands, mark it public, and at the bottom say hands new. And that should be all we need to do. So, program working again. It looks like I didn't actually need to use item in our main program, and I need to move the attribute about manual swapping to the method juggle. And now we're warning free again. So going over what we did, we took the functions that manipulated hands and item and grouped them together with those structures by placing them into a new block called an implementation block, or impl for short. Basically, these are special functions called methods. The functions are closely associated with the type hands. They have access to all the inner details of hands. It also opens up an easier way of expressing it in the syntax, which is that it, wherever we say the word hands inside the implementation block, we can say self instead. So let's go ahead and change that. Think of self as a placeholder for the type of the implementation. So if we were to say change hands to feet, we would not have to change the self in any place. Now taking this one step further, whenever we have a method whose first argument is of the type that we're implementing, we can consolidate this down by re replacing the name of the parameter and the type with lowercase self. 
So hands in this case becomes self. And here as well. In this case, because we're borrowing self, we have to say borrow self. And replace hands with self. And while I'm at it, I'll do the same thing with item. So this is simply borrow self. Note that it has to be the first parameter of the method. You can't do that by placing it second like this. Unfortunately, it's not allowed. One final bit of syntactic sugar is in how we call the methods. Whenever we have an object of a certain type and we're going to call a method on that value, we can simply move it in front. So in this case, it would just be hands. And put a dot and then remove the type name and the colon colon. And we don't even have to say that we're borrowing it. Rust figures out from the signature of report that it's being borrowed versus being owned. So we can do the same thing here with juggle. Right now, juggle is going to own hands, but it looks the same. We just say hands equal hands.juggle. And then we fix up the last line. And our program continues to work. So in summary, in this video, we explored the concepts of ownership, borrowing, and showed how we can make functions into methods of structures in order to gain access to the internals of those structures. Hopefully by now you're comfortable with function parameters. In the next video, we're going to explore generics where our types can become parameterized too. So thank you for watching and I hope you continue with the series.